We are so glad that you decided to tune in with us. You know, it is not, uh, I hope you're not taking it for granted that um, you have the ability to log on to us because we are not taking it for granted. There, right now, there are so many other choices that you have and you have taken the time to log on with us and we are extremely happy. So in case you're worshiping with us from Jamaica, we want to say, whoa, go on, brethren. In case you are um, visiting from some Spanish place, Cuba, um, Honduras, one of those places, DR, not for, want, don't want to leave out Sister Life. I um, want to say, Bienvenidos, Feliz Sabado. I hope by now that you have a smile on your face. That is the warmth that we feel here and we'd want to extend to you. Haiti, Sapase. Bon shava! All those visiting from Haiti, don't want to leave you out. I don't have any, an extensive um, command of the languages, so that's all I know for now. But at the same time, I'm hoping that you feel welcome and that we really appreciate you logging on with us. Um, we, today is a family life program, and we're hoping that you will stay tuned and you'll get something about um, family relations, and then you'll experience a better family life. Again, welcome one, welcome on. Stay tuned for our children's story. Today's story is called, He's Alive. The memory verse is from Mark chapter 16, verse 15. It says, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Today's message is we serve God when we tell others that Jesus is risen. Have you ever had some good news you wanted to share? Maybe you just couldn't wait to tell someone. Mary Magdalene was among the first to know that Jesus had been resurrected and she, and she couldn't, couldn't wait, wait to tell the world. The world. It, it was, was Sunday morning after, after the most difficult Sabbath of Jesus' disciples, disciples' lives. Jesus had just died a few hours before sundown on Friday. His sad, 
troubled followers had buried him quickly in a tomb that belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. Then they had hurried home to observe the Sabbath. The women who had been at the cross wanted to serve Jesus by caring for his body. They had followed and watched as he was laid in the tomb. They saw the heavy stone rolled across the opening to seal it. They too had rested on the Sabbath, but at daylight on Sunday morning they hurried to the grave. The burial spices they carried were to anoint his body. Who is going to roll away that heavy stone for us? They wondered as they neared the tomb. They didn't know that an angel had already been to the tomb. With a mighty earthquake he had rolled away the stone, and he had called Jesus to life in the name of the Father. The women trembled at the sight of the open tomb. Bravely they looked inside. An angel, shining with the glory of heaven, spoke to them. Do not be afraid, said the angel. I know that you are looking for Jesus, but he is not here. He has risen from the dead, just as he said he would. Go quickly and tell his disciples, Jesus is on his way to Galilee, and you will see him there. Can you imagine the shock? After all that had happened the past few days, the women probably didn't know what to think. The Bible says that with fear and great joy they ran to tell the others. Can you imagine them dropping their spices? Can you see them running back to town as fast as they could go? Do you think they were full of energy? Of course they were! Do you think they were enthusiastic? Without a doubt. Nothing could stop them. They had to share the good news Jesus had risen from the dead. We have the honor of sharing that same message with the world today. Before he left earth to return to heaven, Jesus spoke to his followers, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Are you ready to tell the world the good news about Jesus? Dear Lord, thank you for allowing your Son, Jesus, to come to earth to save us. We can never thank you enough. Keep your words firmly planted in our hearts. Lord, renew our hearts, minds, and lives. Let your light continue to shine in us, through us, and over us. In your name we pray, amen. No, no. 
blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Glory, glory, this I see, nothing but the Sabbath, everyone. Our scripture reading this morning will be taken from the book of Romans. It's going to be chapter 12, and we will be reading verses 1 through 10. So that's Romans 12, 1 to 10. Brother Greenland and I will be reading alternately. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ, and every member one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us. Whether prophecy, let's prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. We're going to do ten together. Be, be kindly, kindly affectioned, affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor preferring one another. Here endeth the reading of a portion of God's holy word.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to Margaret SDA. And thank you for joining us. And I'm here, and I was giving the privilege of uh, giving you guys the opportunity to contribute to, to the work here at Margaret SDA and, um, and to the conference itself. Because in this world, uh, nowadays, there's just, so, there's just so many stories of darkness and sadness. And many people lose hope. Margaret SDA is a place where you could learn of how to see the light and to get that hope, not just here while on earth, but that everlasting hope. Of, and, and we do that by introducing everyone who tunes in every Sabbath to Christ. To fund that ministry, uh, you have the opportunity of uh, of making contributions in many ways. And I'm here to share with you the ways that this can be done. First of all, you could uh, contribute to, uh, to us via the Cash App and just look for Dollar Sign Margate SDA and make your contributions. Also, you could download the Adventist Giving app on your iPhone or on your Android device. And finally, uh, you could also um, mail your contributions to Margaret SDA Church. Oh, no, you could you come to the drop box. You could come to the church and make your contribution by, and by dropping your, uh, your offering at the drop box. And the address for Margaret SDA Church. And Oh, okay. <laughs> cool. So thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the service. Amen. Is now the time where we beckon unto our Heavenly Father. There are so many needs that are in the world at this time, but for the Christian, we know that we have a Heavenly Father whose hand is not short nor his ear is heavy. So we have this hope that burns within our hearts so that we are not depressed or dismal in any sort of dismal situation because we know our Heavenly Father. At this point in time, I ask that you bow your heads. I'll be silent for about 10 seconds as I give you an opportunity to make your personal intercession and then I'll pray on our behalf. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, Lord, in the model prayer, you have instructed us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven. Lord, you have compared us by saying, if you being sinful know how to give good gifts, how much more will your heavenly Father give to his children? So Lord, it is with this acknowledgement that we come before you this morning with our needs present before you, with our praise present before you. 
Lord, we understand that even in the midst of want, you are our shepherd. And therefore, we shall not want because you are our shepherd. Father in heaven, we want to lift our hearts to you. We understand and know that there isn't much time left. The songs have long been sung that are pointing to your coming. The handwriting has been on the wall. The signs in the heavens. Lord, even we're living in an unprecedented time where there is the spread of a virus and disease. Lord, these things were all prophesied that it is not by chance that these things have come. And so, Lord, you have given us this hope because you have told us before. So, therefore, we should be looking up to your soon coming. Lord, you have given us the rest of the signs. You have warned us of an antichrist that is supposed to come. You have warned us of many, many other dangers that will be coming. But Lord, again, you have fused hope in those warnings in that you have said that he shall, that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And so, Lord, as we have not been gathering together as we were accustomed. The, we ask, Lord, that you continue to help us that we will not lose faith. But in these times of solitude, dear Lord, we will continue to seek your face. We'll continue to search your word because it is in them that we find eternal life. So, Lord, as we continue to search and seek you have promised us, Lord, that if we search for you with our whole heart, then we will find you. So at this time, Lord, we ask that you will not disappoint us in any way, but that you continue to pour out yourself. You continue to pour out your love to us. Lord, this week we read in the quarterly about how you went in search of Adam and Eve, even after they had transgressed. And in the law, there was no provision for grace. But because you are a gracious father, Lord, you went in search of them. Because you are a God of love, you will not allow your children to perish. And so, Lord, with this consciousness, we ask that even the vilest sinner, that one who thinks there's no hope for him at this time, Lord, because of this prayer, he'll recognize, she'll recognize that there is hope. We understand, dear Lord, and we sing them in the songs that we cannot out sin your grace. Because you are an infinite God with infinite resources and you are beyond comprehension. We can't fully grasp or understand who you are. But Lord, if we will only but tap in to the resources that you have. You have promised us that you will open the windows of heaven to those who are faithful so that there won't be room enough to receive it. So Lord, I ask that you'll ignite a fire in your people one more time by your Holy Spirit. Lord, you have said if we ask for the Holy Spirit, you will not disappoint us. So this morning we are asking, Lord, grant us your Holy Spirit that when that time of probation shall close, we will find ourselves ready and waiting for our Lord. Lord, I want to put the speaker before you this morning. He has prepared a message for your people. But Lord, if you will but inhabit that message, then people listening will get way more than he had intended, but will receive a message directly from you. Lord, I ask that you cover him with the Holy Spirit, that his words will become your words, that he will speak boldly the truth that you have placed on his heart. We ask, dear Lord, that all things, even the rest of the program, will be taken into your consideration so that everything will be done to your name's honor and glory. We pray it in Jesus' name.
privilege is mine to introduce the speaker to you. So the speaker for today is going to be Pastor Lloyd Allen. He is a trained family therapist. So if, you, if you're having family issues, I present to you Pastor Allen. He's also a clinical mental health counselor. He specializes in marriage, family, and couples therapy. So if it is that you just want to enhance your marriage, I present to you Pastor Allen. If it is that you're having problems with your children, I present to you Pastor Allen. Now he's also a mental health counselor. So if you're having mental health challenges, whether it be you're struggling with depression, anxiety, and you want counseling, Christian counseling, I present to you Pastor Allen. Pastor Allen is also so a minister of religion. So if you want to find your way to Jesus, I present to you Pastor Allen. Oh, Pastor Allen, right here I have a list of schools that he graduated from. However, he is happily married and he has two sons. So I believe that is what qualifies him most to be presenting to you Family Matters today. He's also an author. So he has written quite a few books. I'll just list A Close Look at Love, Sex, and Relationships, and Finding Love and Keeping It. So if you're single... You're trying to find love, I present to you Pastor Allen. He also has tips to ignite and maintain the flame of love in your relationship. So if you're looking for love, whether you're married and you're looking for it, or you're married and you have still haven't found it, I present to you Pastor Allen. So I'm hoping that as he presents the message today, you will learn something to enhance your family life. But before he comes... We'll take a special. Give him the 
of the fragments of your broken life, my friend. The potter wants to put you back together again. Oh, the potter wants to put you back together again. We need joy. Ooh, joy in the potter's house. We need peace. We there need is peace in the potter's house. house. And there is also love. There is love in the potter's house. And there is also salvation. There is salvation in the potter's house. And I know there is also healing. There is healing in the potter's house. And once more, there is deliverance. There is deliverance in the potter's house. There is joy. There is joy in the potter's house. Somebody say peace, peace. There is peace in the potter's house. In the potter's house And there is healing There is healing In the potter's house And there is deliverance There is deliverance In the potter's house You'll find, you find Everything you need In the potter's house You'll find, you find Everything you need in the part of us, you find everything, everything in the part of us, you find everything, everything in the part of us. The part of walls to put you back together again. That's right. Oh, the potter wants to put you back together again. Hallelujah. Good morning, good morning, good morning, saints of God. I'm excited to be able to share with you today on this God's holy Sabbath. Wherever you are, we just want you to know, we just want you to know that we are just happy that you took the time out to share with us at the Margate Seventh-day Adventist Church. What a joy it is just to be here to fellowship with the brethren, what do you say? And all of you watching across the world, we just want you to know that you are the lily you are the chrysanthemum you are the flowers in our garden and you are extra special to us today we are happy that you came to join us and our prayer is that you receive a special blessing the blessing that you came in need of thank you so much for your kind words sister greenland and thank you so much for all those who sang indeed we know that the song of praise is the atmosphere of heaven and so we thank you so much for enhancing our service with your beautiful singing now today we are back to family life amen amen and the subject is building rock solid relationships building rock solid relationships amen let us pray loving father come by here speak to our hearts now We'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. amen and amen. Now, friends, we have a passage of scripture that was read very ably uh, earlier by the wonderful couple. From the book of Romans, chapter 12. And I'd like to zero in on uh, the verse 10. Chapter 12, Romans, chapter 12. And verse 10, 
And it's interesting, the Bible says here, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another preferring one another another rendering of the bible says be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love outdoing each other in showing honor outdoing each other in showing honor it's not about me it's not about what i can how much i can embellish my own soul but is how much i can validate and affirm others that's the language of scripture and that's what the bible is talking about today in honor preferring one another many people have a quandary, a state of confusion as it relates to marriage. They cannot understand why is it that marriage is so difficult. They don't understand why there is so much brokenness in marriages today. You know, friends, if we never sinned, there would be no broken marriage. <laughs> For when God conferred upon the first pair when God wed them in the only estate of matrimony God declared it was very good so marriage was designed by God to be very good that's it marriage was designed to be very good but if we don't understand the spiritual context of marriage, we will always be confused. God gave marriage. Did you know that marriage was not given to sinful beings? Amen. <laughs> marriage was given first and foremost to holy beings sinless beings remember god gave marriage to people before they sinned so the reason we have so much brokenness today in relationships it is because of sin is that clear and so if we want to restore relationships if we want an antidote to the sin problem we must look to the sinfulness of our own hearts let me ask you this today what is it that makes a marriage miserable hello what is it that makes a marriage miserable oh i know it's the chandelier oh no no it's not the chandelier i know it's the dishwasher <laughs> hello oh no it's not the dishwasher so what is it i know it's the lights no my friends the marriage is miserable because of people in other words, the marriage is miserable because there are so miserable people that make up the marriage. Amen. And so if we want a happy marriage, we need to have happy people. So the place we begin in fixing marriage is fixing people. That's where we begin in fixing marriage. Fixing people. God reminds us in Ezekiel chapter uh, 26, 30, what does it say there? It says, when the Spirit of God comes, He takes away our stony heart. And He gives us a heart of flesh. That's the problem with marriage. People have a stony heart. Stony heart. Stony heart. Stony heart. What's a stony heart? 
The stony heart is a heart that is insensitive. The stony heart is a heart that does not feel. A man can look in, his, in the eyes of his wife and he, he hurls the most derogatory language. He calls her names. He degrades and berates her. She can look upon her husband and when she's finished with him, she reduces him to tears because of her verbal assassination. That's the heart of stone. The heart that does not feel. That's the heart of stone before the Spirit of God takes control. And so, friends, if we are to have a great marriage, we need a transformation of our hearts. Amen? No wonder Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, the heart you was born, the heart you were born with, is depraved, messed up, skewed, distorted, and rugged. The heart you were born with, Nicodemus, that heart you cannot live with. No wonder one, 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 one family advocate says, if you are to have a great marriage, you cannot live according to the dictates of your own evil heart. You cannot just think it and speak it. I don't care. I don't care. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind when I get home. I don't care. Living according to the decades of our own natural evil heart. And then you talk about having a great marriage. Forget it. It's only a dream. If we are to have a great marriage, friends, we must do like what the Apostle Paul says. He says, I bring my body under subjection. Everything about having a great marriage has to do with disciplining the mind. Amen? This is, you cannot just speak it just because you think it. You and I know some of the things that sometimes come in our minds. And if we were to always unleash those upon our spouse, they cannot but live in misery. We must always be in control of our own hearts. Amen? And so the heart that we're born with is messed up. But we need a new heart that comes from Jesus. He will take away this stony heart and he will give us a heart of flesh. And so, friends, that's the problem with marriage. But today I want to give you a few more details here. How we fix that. I want to share with you the four predictors of divorce. The, the four issues, the four major missiles that destroy marriage. Are you with me today? Four things that destroy marriage and how to fix them. Number one is criticism. Hello? Criticism. <laughs> All of you who are married, watch this today. If you are married, if you are serious about having a great relationship, you must start develop a mentality of positivity. Being positive. Oh, Proverbs 14, Proverbs, Proverbs, Proverbs 16, 24 reminds us. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, health to the bones. Must develop a culture of appreciation, an attitude of positivity in your home. The first major destruction, destruction, the structure of, of, of marriage. Oh, friends. It's called, um, one man, uh, Dr. Gottman, you know, he, he develops the concept, you know, he calls it the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Four of them we're going to talk about today. Do you want to hear about them? Four horsemen of the apocalypse. What's apocalypse? End time events. Isn't that right? When we talk about the apocalypse, end time events. And we talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Oh, friend, you know what it means? I'm going to tell about them. If you ride these four horsemen, horses, 
or any one of them. If you ride these four horses, guess what? They will take you to the end of your marriage. And that's why they're called the four predictors of divorce. And so if you possess any of these in your marriage, if you're in the habit of riding any of these horses, you must jump off today. Amen. What's the first one? Criticism. What is criticism? Wow, criticism. Criticism is the expression of disapproval based on perceived faults or mistakes. <laughs> what is criticism? Criticism is when you are always seeking, you're scanning the atmosphere to see the faults of your spouse. Hello? When you come in the moment you get in the house, you're looking around, trying to find something wrong that he did. Focusing on their faults and flaws and mistakes. Friends, that's what the evil heart does. Are you with me today? But friends, in marriage, we don't do that. In marriage, you know what we do? In marriage, we scan the environment to see what's right in our spouse. What about that? Oh, you didn't hear that now. We scan the environment to see something good in our spouse. Amen? Oh, we need to get that. You know, in premarital counseling, one of the things I tell my, uh, my singles is this. Before, while courting, keep both eyes open. <laughs> Amen. That means you must see everything. Right. When courting, keep both eyes open. But when married, shut one. Amen. <laughs> Is that clear? You cannot be seeing everything. Oh boy, everything is a problem. Mm. And you make a mountain of every mole hill. Oh boy, the person only has to cough and you're ready to belch. Mm -mm -mm. Everything you see, everything is a problem. After a while, the person has to be walking on eggshell. One man was once asked, what ruined your marriage? <laughs> eggshell, right? He said, what ruined your marriage? He said, cancer. Then he went on to tell the story. The wife was sick. She had cancer. He did everything in his powers to help her. He changed his job routine so he could have flexible hours to help her. He went online and he ordered blood samples and he ordered all the equipment just to help her. But then, he was so, he got so impatient with her. He was helping her, but she was living in hell. She told the story. Of course, he was telling the story. After a while, he got so impatient with her, her under her sickness. She would come home. He would just tell her off. He's helping her, but telling her off. 
Oh, you so dependent. You want everything. What more to do? You are this. You are that. You are reckless. You are like a baby. You can't do anything. Look at you. You are worthless. Who can live in that atmosphere? Who can live in that atmosphere? I tell people everywhere, if you are living in a bad marriage and you are suffering in silence, don't just sit back. Do something about it. Get help. God did not design you to spend your life in misery. You have one life to live. And you can get help. Call the pastor, call a counselor, but don't just sit back in it. Oh, well, you know, we're married already. So I must only take up my cross. <laughs> I can't get rid of it. I can't get out. Lord, please take my life soon. Who told you so? He came home one day, and you know what happened? She could not take it any longer. When he looked at the table, he saw a letter. He saw a letter. She was gone. The letter was a divorce notice. I'm divorcing you. What ruined your marriage? Not cancer. Your words of criticism. Words of criticism. Friends, I told you that's another horse. Horseman of the apocalypse. There are four of them. Number one, criticism. Criticism can destroy your marriage. Amen? Amen? No way. That's not how you live. What's the antidote to that? What's the antidote? You know what the antidote is? You create a culture of appreciation in your home. Amen. You always, watch this now, instead of focusing on the flaws and failures and mishaps of your spouse, forget about those. We're talking about the minor flaws. We're not talking about salvific and consequential issues. No, the minor flaws. Forget about those. And instead, focus on the good in them. In other words, identify the good they do and verbalize it to them acknowledge it celebrate them for it in other words make a big thing of their small accomplishments that's how you do marriage amen that's how you do marriage Understand human nature. Everybody has to live with himself 24-7. And if you spend your life trying to tear down, disparage, and discredit another, they will spend their life defending themselves. What do you get? A combative, corrosive, and a toxic relationship. Amen? Exactly. Instead, friends, forget about their minor flaws and failures. And make a big thing of their small accomplishments. That's how the Apostle Paul inspired people, friends. Watch this now. He, 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 he identified the good in them. He celebrated them for it. Thus, he inspired them to be their best. Amen. That's how you get the best out of your spouse. Validate them, praise them, affirm them. Amen. How do children thrive? Children thrive on words of commendation and expression of appreciation. So I have a word for singles today. If you are courting and that boyfriend or that girlfriend, all that can emanate from their lips are curse words. Corrupt communication, negative language, abusive words, criticism, run for your life. Amen. Amen. Until they get help. But pastor, I love them. They will change, you know. 
it's only now, really? If they won't change to get you, they won't change to keep you. Amen. So don't rest your hope on that criticism. One of the other horsemen of the apocalypse. What's the second one? The second one is defensiveness. Hello? Is what? Defensiveness. This is where a person will not accept blame. They will not take responsibility for anything in the marriage. And they are always meeting complaint with complaint. <laughs> Oh, you know, I don't like it. Why you don't like it? It's you make it happen that way. I, I, I don't know what I don't like that. You know, it hurt me. Well, it hurt you. Well, get something. I don't know what happened to you. You get the point? Always meeting complaint with complaint. And they never take responsibility for the relationship. Anything in the relationship. We call it defensiveness. <laughs> Hello. Always trying to make themselves look good. They always have a chip on the shoulder. And they lack humility. And they'll, all, they'll spend their life trying to convince you that they are great. Hello? Friends, how do we fix that? Nobody's perfect. Is that clear? Your spouse is not perfect. Neither are you. Amen? So why do you think that, okay, you can never make a mistake? So, in relationship, in marriage, you, when there's conflict, how to fix defensiveness? You take responsibility for even a part of the conflict. Amen? Take responsibility for it. And say, so, well, oh, 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 oh. You know, I came last night, and I wanted to say something, but you are the only one talking. You are the one talking. I feel so bad about it. You could respond by saying, well, well I don't care about you. You are here later. No, no. What you say instead is this. You know, I think I had a bad day. I was so busy. So when I came, I was so tired. I did not even realize. I was not even aware of what you were saying. So I'm sorry about it. Is that clear? That's how you take responsibility. I was so tired, I was not even aware of this. Take responsibility, friends. Do you understand then why to have a great marriage, we need humility? Amen? Amen. Amen. You don't have to rant and rave. No. We need humility. Is that right? That's the second thing, defensiveness, dangerous. The third thing, the third horseman of the apocalypse is what we call stonewalling. Are you with me today? Stone what? Walling. Stonewalling is when a person has emotionally checked out of the relationship. <laughs> they shut down. I don't want to talk about it. Didn't I tell you not to talk about it? Leave it alone. I'm over. The other person wants to talk, wants to communicate, but they cannot penetrate you, for you have become a brick wall. Is that clear? Some people, what they do then, instead of using a 40 pound cannon, they go for the 60 pound cannon and they come back. Don't know you want to say, oh, I'm talking to you. And they try to be more forceful. That can only create more discord. Is that clear? Friends, whenever a person wants to talk to you. And you shut down. You will not listen. You will not reciprocate the conversation. You know what happens there? The other person feels suffocated. <laughs> they feel as though they are dying. Did you know, friends, when you're in a relationship, there is a need to be heard. Is that clear? 
Everybody has a primal need to be heard. And if you will not reciprocate the conversation, if you will not listen and offer fee reasonable feedback, you make the other person feel suffocated, like they are dying. <laughs> Friends, when a person cannot talk to you, when a person cannot talk to you, you know what you are driving them to do? To talk to somebody else. Hello? And then now they go and they talk to their mother. You are mad. <gasps> you talk to your in-law. Oh, what happened to us? But you forgot you were not listening. You had shut down. Stonewalling. Dangerous. Dangerous. So friends, even if you're angry, even if you're angry, watch this now. The Bible says be angry. <laughs> so it's okay to be angry. We validate emotion here. Is that clear? We, in our church, we're not pretenders. No, we respect emotion. You feel that way? Yes, you feel that way. As a matter of fact, I'm afraid of a man who has no emotion. Hello? He cannot be passionate about anything. He believes nothing. And will defend nothing. <laughs> people must be able to respect the way they feel is that clear validatory emotion did you know sometimes even in our church sometimes our church make people feel that they are not to be intelligent with their emotion how are you doing oh they are dying in the marriage right but guess what? Because of what the other members will say or do, I'm okay, I'm happy, I'm happy. Uh, and they have to be putting on a front. Friend, let me just tell you this today. Sometimes, you know, of course, it has to do sometimes with culture. Because, for example, I want to tell you this. In my program, even when I was doing a family therapy program at, bar, uh, at the university here in the U.S., Even my professors, they have their therapists. My other colleagues, they say, oh yeah, um, I have to go because I have an appointment with my therapist. Is that clear? But in our church sometimes, we hear that, you know, people are afraid of therapy. Is that clear? Because sometimes it's what others will say. Is that clear, friends? Everybody needs a coach. Why do, why do children need parents? Because they have not been there yet. The children, the parents are like the therapist, the leader, the coach, their mentor to direct them. If I have a broken, dysfunctional car, I go to the mechanic. Why? He knows more than I do. And if somebody is there, he specializes in that. You go for help. Why is it you're suffering in your marriage? 10 years, 30, 20 years, 30 years. And you think you can fix it. You have not fixed it for 30 years. <laughs> we must get our people, friends, into the habit of seeking help for their brokenness. In their relationship. Is that clear? Jesus himself. While he was in pain. He cried out to his disciples. Is that right? He spoke to them. He needed the help of his companions. Is he, Ecclesiastes tells us. As iron sharpness iron. So one man the countenance of his friend. Why do you think you can make it alone? Why does Jesus send the people in, in missionary activities two by two? If he knew you alone could make it, he wouldn't send them two by two. People need people. Amen. And so, friends, we must get used to the habit of finding help. It pains my heart when I see people hurting in their marriage, suffering in their marriage, five years, ten years, fifteen years, and they will not seek help. 
Lord, please take me to my grave. Lord, please help me to die soon. For the church tells me I'm not to divorce. <laughs> so please take me to my end. Did you know an aircraft, 95% of the time that the aircraft is traveling, it is off course, 95% of the time. Then it is what? It is the 5% of the time. Watch this now. It is the 5% of the time that he goes to the, to the radar, to the instrument, and he ca we calculate and it brings it right back on course, especially during landing. Is that clear? The instrument, the intelligence in the plane brings him back on course each time. Exactly. But 95% of the time, it's off course. Hello, friends. If you are off course, 95% of the time, you need an intervention to bring you back on course. Amen. So, friends, as a church, we should seek help. And by the way, may I say to those let me say something about confidentiality in our church. When the member talks to you about their problem, yes, sir. hello? Yes, sir. Bury it. Yes. Amen. You know what I normally tell my elders as a pastor? I say, as elders, whenever you hear the member's problems, your brain should be a graveyard. Yes. In other words, when it comes here, you bury it. Amen. Amen. Don't go around and tell other people about it. Oh, friends, folk have come to me crying in pain. They told others of the problem that they thought would help them. They heard it next time in testimony service or something else. <laughs> Hello today. As the members of the church, we must be intelligent when dealing with all the fellow members, amen. We must love and respect each other. Is that right? We must understand that people are fragile. And we can destroy people with the wrong use of our tongue. Amen. We must set a guard upon our tongue. I want to tell you today, so we have the first one. The first, the first, the first, um, Horseman of the apocalypse. What is it? Criticism. The second is what? Come now, you're good students. The first, second is what? Talk to me. Defensive. Defensiveness. The third is? Stonewalling. Wonderful. I have good students today. And guess what now? The fourth. The fourth is the most dangerous. You know what the fourth one is? The fourth one is contempt. Mm -mm -mm. Is what? Contempt. You know what contempt is? When you look down upon another and you treat them with scorn and disdain. Hello. And one of the ways you manifest that is when you start calling him or her names. Derogatory names. In other words, if I could climb up on this today, I would show you what I mean. You stand up on a pedestal and you're looking down at them. Mm -mm -mm. Are you with me today? Disdain. You, you assume a position of greatness. I'm greater than you. I'm more pure than you. I'm, I'm more intelligent than you. I'm more affectionate than you. Look at you. You don't even measure up. Your opinion does not even matter. You are not even important. Look at you. And then you give a, and then you give us a, a scornful laugh. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> I'm not like that, thank God. Look at you. And then you call them names. You are this. You are that. You're like your mama. 
like your grandmother, like your granddad. Eh? Look at you, where you came from. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, health to the bones. Watch this now. The converse is also true. Unpleasant words, not healing to the bones, but what? Disease to the bones. People sometimes don't understand the power of their words. Did you know, friends, you, many times the verbal wound is more dangerous than the physical wound and takes longer to heal. Amen. Do you understand, friends, why we need the presence of God's Holy Spirit? Amen. To convert, transform our tongue so we can do marriage well. I want to focus now, friends, finally. Let me just give you a few tips to fix it, and then I'll take my seat. How do we fix that? Number one, you what? As I said earlier, you accept responsibility for your part of the problem. Is that right? Accept responsibility, number one. Number two, you create a culture of appreciation. Amen. What does that mean? You communicate respect. And you show that you are proud of the people you love. Amen. What do you say? In other words, you live to praise your spouse. Some people don't like doing that. I said to one man today, one day sometime ago, a young man, I said, Do you sometimes praise your wife? He said, No, Pastor. If I tell her that, her, her, her head will swell. Just to make it swell. <laughs> Friends, do you know what I realize? How difficult it is for many people to praise their spouse. Hello? One man was once asked, tell me, when you were courting, what was it that inspired you? What was it that drove you to your spouse? What was it that, that inspired you to, to want to be with this girl? He said, wow, man, when I saw her boy, is that, man, she was the most intelligent, she was the most beautiful, she was the most wonderful human being I've ever seen, and a result that I wanted to be with her. After 17 years, he was asked, have you ever told her that? Never. No wonder, guess what? The woman lived her life feeling unappreciated, working so hard, but nobody could tell her that she was doing well. Many marriages are love starved. People are dying, hello, because their spouse is stingy with their praise. They have it in their mind, but they will not say it. Proverbs 31 talks about the, 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 the wonderful woman, the prudent woman. And then it says, her husband praiseth her. Did you know when you praise somebody and you tell them that they are doing well, it helps them to do better? <laughs> oh, that's another sermon. Friends, we must get in the habit of praising our spouse. What? Praising our spouse. Your home, in your home, you create a culture of appreciation. Amen. Is that right? You're always scanning the atmosphere. Scanning the atmosphere for something for which you can praise him. Amen. What do you say? In other words, men, I have a word for you. Speak to the queen in your woman. Amen. And ladies, speak to the king in your man. In other words, identify the good in them 
and celebrate it. That's how we do marriage. That means when he comes home, is that right? When he comes home, you stand at the door. Is that right? Even if it's sweet nonsense, is that right? And you say to him, honey, if life was a cabbage, the leaves would I give to others and the heart to you. Amen. Even sweet nonsense is not right. Praise him. What do you say? When you see her on the job, man, you call her sometime. And you say, honey, I just call. Amen. <laughs> Praise your spouse. Isn't that right? One day I told you, right? My wife was sleeping. I, I got up in early in the morning. She was still asleep. I took the phone and took a picture of her while she was sleeping. Then when she got up, I showed her the picture. I said, hmm. Then I said, sweetheart, even while you're sleeping, you are beautiful. Amen. Oh, that made her day. That made her day and that made my day too. Amen. Amen. Praise her. Did you know friendship is the basis for love? Sex and intimacy and passion. Friendship. Be a friend to your spouse. Amen. In other words, watch this now. You must be renewing courtship every day. That's how you praise your spouse. Children thrive. Not on criticism. Children thrive and flourish on words of commendation and expression of appreciation. And so does your spouse. You want to create a beautiful home? Make your home a circus of celebration. What do you say? Oh, yes. Your husband comes home in the evening. You stand by the door and you say, Honey, you must be tired today. What do you mean I'm tired? Yes. You must be tired for you kept running in my mind all day. Amen. Is that right? Must be tired. Is that right? You celebrate him. In other words, love them with your words. It's not right. When somebody treats you like that, oh, friends, when somebody, when you're in a relationship and you feel liked, loved, and respected, you are not going anywhere. Yes, are you with me today? Yes. You must feel liked, loved, and respected. Amen. What do you say? Not going anywhere. One man was once asked, why is it, man, that you don't cheat on your spouse? Why is it you don't cheat on your spouse? He said, back in the day, you know, you know those tiny little Volkswagen, you know? Yeah. He says, man, how can I go out on the street and steal a Volkswagen when I have a Cadillac at home? Amen. Praise your spouse, what do you say? When you praise your spouse, they're going to always want to be there. Make your home a circus of celebration. Create a culture of appreciation and make your home a little heaven on earth. Amen. I hope above all things that we <laughs> try it again. <laughs> I hope above all things that we learned something about maintaining our relationships. The, the council was to direct it towards marriage, but I think it has a universal appeal to relationships. If we want our relationships to last, we need to avoid those four horsemen. All right, we want to thank Pastor Allen 
for coming and sharing those gems with us. And we, he will be back this afternoon for the AY program where we'll be doing a question and answer session. And I know, I'm told that there's more, so you definitely don't want to miss what we have in store for you this afternoon. All right, with that being said, we now will bow our heads for the benediction. Father in heaven, we just want to tell you thanks for your holy Sabbath day, a day in which we can come apart and focus entirely on you. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you, Lord, for sending your messenger with a message. And Lord, we ask that you'll help us now to implement what we have learned. Not that this will be another sermon that coming in to the left and going out to the right, but that this one will stay with us so that we will have better relationships. Thank you, Lord, once again for this message. And now as we come to an end of the service, Lord, we ask that you continue to provide for us and to provide that Sabbath's blessing, we pray in Jesus' name. You fight everything you need in the part of us. You fight everything, everything in the part of us. You fight everything. Everything in the potter's house. The potter wants to put you back together again. That's right. Oh, the potter wants to put you back together again.